the world looks to California to answer the hard questions for redemption, to introduce the unfamiliar, to be resilient. Because California bounces back, holds us accountable, values who we are, remains vigilant, defies those in our way, and stands for community. Here on the West Coast, we're at the center of it all. Los Angeles Times, the state of what's next. Good evening and welcome to Pulse of the Nation, a virtual event on the 2020 election hosted by the Los Angeles Times and UCLA. My name is Melanie Mason. I'm a political reporter with the Times covering the presidential race. We are so glad that you can join us tonight for the first in a series of events that the Times and UCLA are doing in hopes of providing context and expertise in the run-up to this consequential election. And speaking of experts, we have two of the very best here with us tonight. So let's bring them into the conversation. First up is Efren Perez, 
a professor of, of political science and psychology at UCLA. His scholarship centers on political psychology with specific interests in racial and ethnic politics, language and political thinking, implicit political cognition, and measurement of political concepts. His book, Unspoken Politics, Implicit Attitudes and Political Thinking, received two prestigious awards from the American Political Science Association. He is also the author of numerous articles in leading political science journals, such as the American Journal of Political Science, the Journal of Politics, and Political Behavior. Beyond his research, Efren directs the Race, Ethnicity, Politics, and Society Experimental Lab and the Center for American Politics and Public Policy. We also have with us tonight Lynn Bavrick. She is the Marvin Hockenberg Professor of American Politics and Public Policy at UCLA, a contributing columnist to The Upshot at The New York Times, and a recipient of the Andrew F. Carnegie Prize in the Humanities and Social Sciences. She is the author of five books, including the most ominous book on the 2016 election, Identity Crisis, the 2016 Presidential Campaign and the Battle for the Meaning of America, and The Gamble, the cho choice and chance in the 2012 presidential election, which has been described as the definitive account of the 2012 presidential race. Political consultants on both sides of the aisle refer to her work on political messaging in The Message Matters as required reading for political candidates. At UCLA, she teaches courses on campaigns, elections, public opinion, and the 1960s. Efren, Lynn, thank you so much for joining with us tonight. Thank you for having, for having us. So we're gonna get into the many ways that this election is unlike any other. Um, but to kick things off, I'd actually like for us to pretend that it's not 2020 right now, that we are in a generic presidential election and it's June, the primaries are, have just finished. We're in that lull between before the general election really starts to heat up after Labor Day. As political scientists, what would you be looking at to sort of assess the state of play? And Lynn, why don't we start with you? Yeah, great. Thanks for coming out tonight, everyone. And thanks for hosting, Melanie. Great question. What if it wasn't 2020? Um, that's a huge thought experiment. But I think for the most part, what I would be looking at right now in a typical presidential election year would be the state of the nation's economy. I'm really interested in the change in the growth rate. GDP, GNP, you could even use real disposable income if you want. Not necessarily the level of those things, but the change from January until June of the election year. So right now in a typical year, we would have just gotten to the part of the year where I felt like I knew something about how the stage was going to be set in terms of what the incumbent could talk about and what the challenger could talk about going into November. And Efren, what about you? What would you be looking at? Yeah, in addition to uh, Lynn's point here about the economy, I think uh, borrowing from Lynn's work, actually, I'd be paying attention to what the alternative is from a message standpoint to the status quo, that is the last two or so years that we've lived under uh, Donald Trump. And um, as far as that goes, um, I think at least on the side of the Democrats, we're waiting to see um, a little bit more clarity on focus and consistency in terms of what that message uh, might be. So to Lynn's point, this was totally a thought experiment because what we know is that 2020 is not a generic presidential election year. So far, we have had a global pandemic. We've had an economic nosedive and mass demonstrations about racial inequality and policing, and it is only June. So now we know our baseline. Uh, Efren, I'll start with you. What are you looking at now in this very real and very uh, surreal 2020 election? Yeah, so, you know, on the side of Democrats and their constituency, as far as uh, people of color are concerned, you know, this in previous elections often ends up being a challenge, right? How to uh, rope in uh, various non-white constituencies, African-Americans, Latinos, Asian-Americans, and it's a, quite a balancing act, right? It's, it's, it's a, essentially an effort to remind all of them and affirm that they're Democrats um, without paying too much special attention to them. I think uh, what we've seen, especially in light of the specific uh, disparities related to COVID, along with the very focused coverage on racial disparities as far as policing is concerned, I think in some ways that task is a little bit easier, right? Because one of the common themes that is running through both of those episodes is this uh, sense a shared sense that things are unequal, right? And that things are unequal for people that are like us. And like us, I mean, 
Uh, so once again, African Americans, Latinos, uh, Asian Americans. And so um, I'm not saying that the task is easier. I'm saying that's just, um, you know, you kind of had something land on your lap by virtue of something that was outside of the control of politicians themselves. And that to me is what's, what's pretty interesting here. Lynn, what about for you? Has, has this sort of triple, uh, triple effect changed how you're approaching this year's election? Well, I think we're going to think about the same elements of a campaign. And Efren mentioned a couple of those a minute ago. What's the incumbent going to talk about? What's the challenger going to talk about? How are voters going to respond to those frames of the election? So all of that is going to be the same. It's just happening in this incredibly unusual context. And I think that we had a little bit of a preview in January and February of how Donald Trump was thinking about 2020. He had a rally in, I think it was Florida, and he came out and he said, you don't like me, but you're going to vote for me because look at the economy. And so I think somewhat surprisingly, he had figured out that the economy was his best play. It's the Janet Jackson question. What have you done for me lately? And when you ask that of people in a time of growth, they say things are pretty good. But then all of that changed. And so now I think that really, in addition to trying to stay healthy, in addition to trying to deal with in injustice, we are waiting to see what is the frame of the 2020 election going to be. And I think that's what we're going to talk about. It's going to be really an interesting hour. I want to get into the economy uh, because, to your point, I think that we see economic indicators as such a um, baseline to understand this election. But let's start with the chronological order. And, and before we had the economic fallout, we had coronavirus. And I'm particularly interested, Lynn, in the work that you've done in understanding American perceptions and attitudes around coronavirus and how much we see those perceptions being shaped by partisan ideology and how much it might be the other way around? Are we seeing the pandemic actually shake up maybe some of these hardened partisan lines? It's really interesting. Um, the pandemic has affected almost everyone's life in one way or another. And by that, I mean, we've asked people, we're in the field with this big survey every week at UCLA, 6,000 people a week. It's called Nationscape. And we put out this COVID brief on Tuesdays. And... We've asked people, how have you changed? Have you, have you been washing your hands more, not visiting friends and family, canceling travel, stocking up on goods, wearing a mask, all these things. And for a lot of these precautions, more than 90% of the population say, yeah, I, I'm doing that. That's like an incredible number in the history of public opinion polling. 90% of people hardly ever agree on anything. So we're seeing lots of people affected by the pandemic in terms of their behavior. When it starts to politicize, when Republican elites start to say things like, this has gone on too long, we need to open the economy, when Donald Trump says, free Michigan, then you start to see a partisan divide and Republicans start to say, time to go out and do things. And Democrats are starting to say, not yet, not so fast. But still, even given the partisan divide, I think the part of the story that often gets missed is that most people are taking precautions and are reluctant to return to activities. So this is a common national experience. The first one, and we're going to talk about two more, but the first common national experience, um, and it's affected everyone. Efren, are you surprised by that, about the sort of unanimity in terms of how people are viewing their own response to coronavirus? Or does that track with what your own research or your own anecdotal experience has shown? Um, I'm actually not surprised. You know, at, at their core, human beings are, are, are social creatures, right? And we're quite responsive to uh, what we see around us, right? Um, and, you know, 90% is actually pretty good. Um, the fact that it's largely driven or in spite of the lack of clear messaging uh, on the side of politicians is even more impressive um, still. Uh, so I think what I'm particularly fascinated um, and what does seem a little bit um, of a wild card here is, you know, in, in political science, there had been um, sort of debates about just how much influence 
things like media and um, sort of opinion leaders have, right? Um, what you have here is essentially due to this pandemic, um, almost a captive audience, right? People are stuck at home. If they're not working, they're tending to kids. If they're not doing that, they're watching news programming. And so for one of those very rare moments in our nation's life, everyone is being exposed, maybe not to the same message, but to comparable messages, right? And that's a, that, that's a big plus in the sense that people are at least more engaged than usual, more attentive than usual. I think the key for me would be um, how long can they keep this up, right? Because in many ways, politics is sort of like part of, of, of a larger life than most people live, right? Um, and so that, that I think is, 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 is one of the things to watch out for. How long can we keep this up where we're attentive, we're tuning in, um, we're updating uh, our beliefs, if you will, based on the information that you get? I think to look at the domino effect now that we're seeing starting with the coronavirus. From the coronavirus, we saw this mandated shutdown of the economy. Um, and with that, that has plunged us uh, into officially a recession, uh, ending the historic economic expansion. We have seen unemployment skyrocket. Uh, and yet, at the same time, we had a better than expected jobs report for the last month. Uh, and we also see the stock market kind of um, rebounding in ways that I think are, are surprising a lot of people. And so I'm wondering, and, and Lynn, we'll start with you, uh, to your point about how the economy matters in a generic election year, what about the economy matters? What are the economic indicators that you think are really going to be the clues for us to interpret this election? It's an incredibly difficult question because, again, in a typical year, we would be looking at actual economic performance. Um, not people's perception, not the answer to the question, do you think the economy is better than it was a year ago? That gets all clouded with people's party identification. If you're the party of the president, you say, oh, yeah, the economy's great. And if you're not in the party of the president, you say, no, it's in the dumpster. But the actual number is a really good predictor of whether the incumbent party is going to win re-election to the White House. And that works in countries all over the world, not just the U.S. This is craziness. This, these numbers, you know, we don't know what to make of numbers like this. But I can tell you this, it's not good for the incumbent party. If you were an incumbent president, you would not want to be running in this economy. And so that's the challenge now facing Donald Trump, who initially came out and said, you don't like me, but you're going to vote for me because of the economy. Now we can't say that. And we have seen him start to pivot. Um, and he's pivoting back to his old standards, his favorite songs, identity. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more um, as we move through the hour. But it's just, whatever it is, it's not good. It's not good for him. Efren, do you agree? And, and, are, and also, do you find these numbers sort of as baffling, this, this situation as unprecedented as Lynn does? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an outlier in terms of the sheer numbers, right? Um, but I think there's actually an opening for um, that's not good for the incumbent um, in terms of the metaphors or analogies that people have to compare this to, right? And we keep going back to like these cataclysmic events, like the Great Depression. That still can't be good, right? I mean, how do you compare this to something that, that close, right? Um, and so that was not Donald Trump's doing. This is sort of the, the very interesting thing, right? He did not cause coronavirus. He has had to respond to coronavirus, not his forte, right? And then as we talk about things like what happened with the unfolding of mass protests in light of uh, the police uh, killings of several African-Americans, same thing. Events outside of his control that are not his strength and he has to react, right? Um, and, and, and I think he's, he's in a tough position when the playbook seems so non-controversial in terms of what to do, right? Like, don't goof up the economy, stay consistently on message. We take out the economy, and we still have not come up with alternative messages that are just as resonant as they were um, when he was strictly speaking to his base. So, Efren, you mentioned the protests. So, so let's move sort of to the, the, the final three of, of the three uh, major events that have happened, um, and that is the killing of George Floyd uh, by Minneapolis police op uh, officers, which has set off demonstrations across the country and across the world uh, about policing and racial inequities. So let's take a minute and listen to how President Trump and former Vice President Biden have weighed in last week on this moment. The biggest victims of the rioting are peace-loving citizens in our poorest communities, 
And as their president, I will fight to keep them safe. I will fight to protect you. I am your president of law and order and an ally of all peaceful protesters. I wish I could say that hate began with Donald Trump and will end with him. It didn't, and it won't. American history isn't a fairy tale with a guaranteed happy ending. The battle for the soul of this nation has been a constant push and pull for more than 240 years. So, Lynn, you wrote the book on political messaging. So what are the messages that you're hearing in those two responses? So there's so much to say about this. Um, and I, I want to make two points about Joe Biden in case I don't get to make them as we go through the hour. The first is that he got, this is, this is going to sound worse than, than I mean it to, but he got lucky here. Um, and that he, he has been saying battle for the soul of the nation for months. This was his primary message as well. And when he started saying it, the battle was with Donald Trump, the battle for the soul of the nation, because this guy took it away from us. And that was, in essence, blaming Trump voters for the state that we're in. When we have this trifecta, the triple crown of tragedies, as you've sort of described it, now the battle for the soul of the nation is for survival, literally, in terms of health, in terms of justice, in terms of making a living. So now he can say we're fighting for the soul of a nation. And he he's no longer insulting Trump voters. He's saying, if you're struggling, you're with me. Trump, on the other and so I think that's all about healing. When Joe Biden is talking about healing, he is at his best. He is more empathetic than Donald Trump. As Efren mentioned, Trump is not a healer. So this is like an election that sort of turned on a dime to be one in which Joe Biden is really advantaged just on sort of natural conditions. Trump, on the other hand, is trying to be a unifier. I'm your president. I'm your law and order president. The problem with that is that those words mean different things to different people. Um, and this is where I'm going to cede the floor to Efren, who can talk about this in a much more interesting way than I can. But even thinking back to messaging in 1968, for example, when a different Republican president said, this is a law and order election, uh, it, it doesn't mean that I'm here to keep everyone safe. It means I'm here to keep some people safe. And that's not a unifying message. And I think that's that's part of where we're heading in 2020. Efren, would you like to weigh in on the Trump messaging that we're hearing in the president's Rose Garden remarks? Yeah, I mean, look, um, as a political scientist, I, I got to take it on the merits. And on the merits, um, I see someone who's basically trying to not advan make advances with new voters, but essentially um, not further uh, distance themselves from, from these voters that I think he didn't have much of a pathway into to begin with, um, and still somehow reaffirm what uh, seems to be a slightly narrowing and narrowing um, uh, base of, of support um, that he has, right? I mean, you can't go, uh, you know, about two years or so um, as president with a message that is only, uh, you know, barely um, can be construed as not um, racist, and then all of a sudden shift, you know, 360 degrees and essentially say, oh, you know what, um, you're actually included in this uh, large circle of who we are, right? And so, um, you know, I think that kind of messaging does good for the people that already support him, but he needs a little bit more than that in terms of um, trying to make inroads during the campaign season. And so, if this is about brainstorming on the fly and implementing them, um, I think he needs to try a little bit more. I, I agree with Lynn that, um, look, Joe Biden did not make these protests. These are, these, these are hard realities uh, for many African-Americans. Um, I think that, again, the fact that they landed on our lap, that we are forced to actually look, because what else are we going to do? Turn the TV off, right? I mean, that's part of what you're seeing, right? The reason that... Um, Biden, in, in a sense, is going to benefit from these tragedies is that all of us, people that maybe were dismissive of these realities, they didn't want to think that this was part of America, now have to contend with, you know, pretty strong visual evidence that 
even if there are some extenuating circumstances, this just looks poor. This looks bad. Um, treatment of anyone that we would deem um, um, American. And so I think for Biden, um, there's an opportunity, it's his to lose, to basically build on that um, and extend uh, beyond sort of the, the traditional basis of support that I think he was um, counting on. I want to delve... Oh, Lynn, go ahead. Can I, can I just jump in for one second and say that Efren reminded me of something that we'll pick up on from the last topic. This is the second point of agreement um, in terms of public opinion for the country as a whole. So this is another national experience that everyone is going through. Almost everyone has seen the video. 75% of people have seen the video. More than eight in 10 people say they agree with the bringing of murder charges. There's um, a lot of support. 86%, almost 90% of people say they think the amount of force was unjust. And so this is a common experience. And it is one that people are looking for someone to make sense of the commonality. And that's where Biden, with his natural empathy and his sort of rhetoric about the soul of our country, all of a sudden that is a healing moment compared to Trump's messaging where he, he struggles to bring people together. It's, it's just not something that he's, um, it's not natural for him. Right. To so, that point, uh, oh, go ahead, Efren. If I could jump in, you know, so so Lynn wrote an incredibly uh, interesting book that you mentioned at, at the beginning of the talk about the election and how it was the meaning of America. And if you want to consider this next election sort of as a round two, you know, what can we expect in, the, in, the, in this next installment, right? So if the 2016 election was in many ways um, essentially a threatened, a white community, right, in light of growing demographics uh, of many other uh, groups, African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, I think this election potentially becomes a conversation about what kinds of members of these different communities do we want to be. So let me give you an example, right? Um, I think throughout Trump's early, uh, early tenure, um, to say, you know, he never came out and said, I strictly represent whites, right? But that's sort of the visual, that's sort of the thrust of the message that he had. Um, and I think if you were to ask non-specialists, who do you think he's referring to? Really what he was, I think, referring to is essentially individuals um, who are unabashedly um, anti-minority, right, and happen to be white. I think now, given COVID, given these mass protests that we're all witnessing uh, on a mass scale, I think you're starting to see some individuals within the larger non-Hispanic white community asking themselves, is that the kind of individual that I want to be? Um, and this is why you see so much diversity of opinion in terms of uh, white individuals wanting to be allies, white individuals wanting to inform themselves, and then other white individuals not climbing down from their horse and saying, this doesn't exist. At the same time, on the other side of the ledger, right, where it was sort of this collective a uh, group uh, of people of color. Um, for the most part right now, I think the glue that is holding them together is that I think most non-Black minorities understand that this is the time for African Americans and their community to shine, right? It's not the same thing as saying that, you know, Latinos can't identify with police brutality or that we can't pick some other issue, some other issue uh, where there's some commonality. But in many ways, part of what you're seeing is other non-Black minorities standing behind um, African Americans and saying, we support you, but this is the time where this, the focus has to be on an issue that is tried and true, uh, been focused on, on African Americans. And I think so long as you have that unity, that recognition, um, that this is about acknowledging a big problem and doing something about it within the Black community, I think you're not gonna see a, um, a much tension, much issues. But all of this could devolve too, right? When you start linking up the immigration issue to the police brutality issue, that sounds like a good idea at first, but then you're basically opening up the door to different groups jockeying over who has the worst grievance against uh, the state. I want to take advantage, Efren, of your expertise and the research that you've done, because as we're talking about racial attitudes in this country, a lot of times we're talking about implicit attitudes. Um, and I've heard it a lot in the context of policing, but we all carry these attitudes and they uh, have impacts in every facet of our lives. 
And so I want to know, Efren, how you think implicit attitudes can help us understand how we've gotten to this moment and how it may play out in our politics in November. Sure. Look, implicit attitudes are really nothing more than um, sort of the consensus beliefs that we have about various groups in society. Um, you know, our brain is wired in such a way where it's picking up information, dissecting patterns and what it gets, and it forms these snap judgments about groups, right? So, you know, without endorsing the view that African Americans are quote unquote bad, um, our brain is latching on to a lot of information circulating around us for decades already, essentially pairing negative things with a particular social group. We all learn that. We learn that as kids. We get socialized into it as, as adults. And so that is sort of the, the implicit attitude that we all have to a degree, myself included. The big difference, I think, in distinguishing, you know, um, how much of an impact these attitudes have has to do with whether people are okay um, falling back on that default response um, or whether they are motivated enough um, to correct views, right? So let me give you an example. If, if, if we ask uh, a random sample of Americans, um, you know, who, which group um, has the hardest workers in the nation, right? Stereotypically, we could all offer uh, a response that would lead to a consensus, right? So that's not going to distinguish us in terms of that automatic gut reaction that we have about groups. What does distinguish us is who follows through on that gut reaction and who tries to correct it. But whether you make that decision depends on what kind of incentives you face um, in the real world. And in politics, you know, one of the lamentable facts, at least in the contemporary era, is that you are egged on to want to be right rather than to get it right. So very few people actually um, have very weak incentives to correct those implicit biases that they may have and so what you would see among those individuals is essentially whatever they are telling you they think about a group is precisely what they feel at a gut level, right? Um, you know, so I think the reason that these implicit attitudes get so much airtime and airplay is that a lot of the insights that are perhaps the most useful come um, by examining individuals who I think strive to do the right thing but are put in really cruddy circumstances and these implicit attitudes get the best of them, right? So in many of these officer-involved shootings, right, you have short time constraints, you have incomplete information, you, you, you really can't go and collect other information, you gotta make a, a, a quick decision. And oftentimes in those circumstances, what ends up uh, uh, leading the officers to shoot is that implicit bias that they may have. Um, the one thing that I would say is, as much as I, I, I have liked to study and continue to do a lot of this work, you know, it's, it's a symptom of a larger structural problem, right? Um, you know, we, we don't develop these implicit attitudes out of thin air. Essentially, our minds are adapting to the environments that we live in. And so if we have something to say about implicit bias and that we're unhappy with the extent to which it plays a role in our, in our society, well, in some ways, the solution is not changing individuals or coaching them on how to say the right things. The solution is you got to have, uh, you know, some structural solutions. And so when you hear a lot of these folks attending the protests wanting deep structural change, I think that sort of acknowledgement that that's the direction that they want to go in, right? We can talk all day about sending people to implicit bias trainings. It might help some but it's not gonna stem the flow of information that essentially gets people to learn these kinds of things in the first place. You know, none of these things, this trifecta that we talked about, nothing's happening in a, a vacuum, right? There's a compounding effect. We've got one trauma really layered on another, um, and particularly for African-Americans who have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. They have been disproportionately impacted by the economic losses caused by the pandemic. And now, of course, in this conversation around policing and, and racial inequities uh, more generally. And Efren, you had said earlier that you see this as, as maybe a galvanizing um, force, that this is something that might motivate people. Uh, but I've also talked to a lot of people uh, over the last couple of weeks who describe a feeling of exhaustion, of trauma. Uh, and I'm wondering if the compounding effects of all of these things being layered upon each other, and, and let's remind ourselves it's only June, um, 
could that lead to people wanting to tune out, wanting to, to drop out of politics? Lynn, do you get a sense that this could be a motivator or maybe a demotivator? I think it's probably not helpful to think of the crises themselves as um, changing how people think about engaging with the election. Because what's going to swamp all of that is the effects of really COVID on how the election is carried out. So we are going to have some sort of unusual convention period, followed by some sort of unusual campaign period where there may not be rallies. Um, there may be a lot of political advertising. And then some sort of election day that might include in-person voting, but might not. Those kinds of changes are probably going to be responsible for more of the shift in participation and engagement with the campaign than just people's feelings of loneliness or anxiety or depression because of what's happening. So as a political reporter, uh, especially now that I'm trapped in my apartment <laughs> trying to cover this campaign, I, I have to keep telling myself as I'm trying to understand the mood of the voters, Twitter is not real life. Oh, um, say that to yourself every day. Every day. <laughs> okay, but at the same time, a lot of our politics is playing out on social media like Twitter, and that especially applies to our president. So this morning, for example, and I, I think we have a graphic of this, uh, the president tweeted an unsubstantiated conspir conspiracy theory about a 75-year-old protester in Buffalo who was hospitalized after being shoved by police. Um, so, Lynn, I'll pose this question to you. Um, is Twitter real life either as a gauge of voter sentiment or as a driver of news? Not as a gauge of voter sentiment. Don't, don't even think that for five seconds. Um, as a source of news, I mean, it, it, yes, you, it, on the one hand, I can say, yes, reporters cover it, but politicians use it now to make public statements. I, I told one of my students, it's like, the fax machine from the 1980s. And they were like, what's a fax machine? You know, but if the president wanted to make news in the 1980s, they had to issue a public statement from the White House. And people got that to the fax machine at the newsroom. He doesn't need to do that anymore. He can issue public statements whenever he wants. Now, there's lots of public opinion evidence that suggests people understand that the tweets from the president are not policy. They are not actual government positions. But they are things that the president of the United States, the leader of the free world, is saying, and senators. And But this is how everybody issues their statements now. So on the one hand, you treat it like a fax machine. Um, but it would be wrong to gauge what you think is happening in the world out there from what you're seeing on any social media. Efren, do you think that there is um, a platform for social media, for um, things, activists who maybe otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to interact with journalists, for example, um, or hashtags such as um, the Black Lives Matter movement, which really, I think, took off in a sense through those hashtags. Is there a way that uh, Twitter, if not perhaps a great barometer of current social um, sentiment, could drive social sentiment? Yeah, so I think it's a, it's a good tool for organizing. I think it's probably a good tool to try to broaden the circle of individuals that might care less about, you know, social, socialite, socialite life, celebrity, and then maybe about actual politics. I think it's, it's, it's effective that way. Um, it's a good way to, to amplify uh, a particular message. Um, but, you know, I also agree with Lynn, e even if we were to say, well, look, you know, how representative or, or how broadly does, um, the Twitterverse of uh, non-white individuals reflect non-white sentiment uh, throughout the U.S. And I would say probably not that much. I think what you're seeing on Twitter um, are the voices of the people who have um, given a lot of these political issues some thought, uh, maybe are involved in politics in some way, uh, shape, or form themselves, um, and are habitually uh, political junkies, but I wouldn't characterize that as the average uh, American or the average individual 
in the United States, I think most individuals um, are still sort of learning about what's going on politically um, as we speak. And if they engage Twitter, it's certainly not about, you know, what did Trump say today? Lynn, you had alluded earlier to a, a somewhat modified convention, whatever that may look like. Uh, and it strikes me that a lot of the features that we're used to in seeing a presidential campaign, a big rah-rah convention, tons of campaign rallies, uh, door knockers, um, you know, fanning out across the country, we are likely not going to be seeing that um, in a very familiar sense. And I'm wondering if that matters, if that ever mattered, or are political journalists like myself sort of looking at the wrong um, barometers when we say a million doors were knocked over the uh, month of October? Were we getting it wrong this whole time? Um, no and yes. Uh, so those kinds of activities do stimulate turnout, just not in the incredible ways that often get reported. So David Axelrod, who many people will recognize as someone who was an architect of Obama's first campaign and victory, which was seen as this great ground game field organizing campaign, even Axelrod will say that that kind of knocking on doors, canvassing the field work is like a field goal unit in football. So if, if you're not familiar with football, that's not the big scoring unit. That's the three points. But the touchdowns are the six points. So messaging, other kinds of campaigning, basic persuasive electioneering tactics are moving people a lot. And then the knocking on doors, this is making a difference. And it makes a difference with turnout. Uh, reminding people an election is coming up and where do they go and how are they going to go? How are you going to get there? Are you registered? All that stuff matters at the margins. Now, I'm not saying that that means that the effects are too small to care about. The 2016 election turned on 77,000 votes across three states. So, yeah, like, I want my field goal unit to be in really sharp form in 2020. So if I were one of these two candidates, I would be trying to figure out, can we socially distance and, and leaflet people's door knobs? Can we put door, you know, something at their door, calling on the telephone, texting? What can we do to try to connect with people? Um, because it, it could be very close. And I believe you had mentioned that we have kind of a captive audience since we're all mostly stuck at home and glued to our screens. So for these touchdown units that Lynn's talking about, the messaging, do you see the the vectors of that being what they were in past campaigns? Is television advertising the coin of the realm? Um, is what what about digital? Um, what do you think are going to be the ways that these campaigns are going to try to score touchdowns? So I, I don't know if they're considering it as a captive audience. I don't think I think they thought that a lot of their um, advertising was already um, getting to people as it is. But you know, having a hit on the airwaves is far different from whether I actually watched it and it, it sort of stimulated a reaction among uh, amongst myself. So um, I think that in terms of uh, the messaging, um, or at the at the very least, the the campaign advertising, this underscores just how important. Um, this conversation that we had earlier about clear messaging. What is the status quo for? Um, and what does a change in the status quo imply, right? Um, and so insofar as they're going to be aggressive, I think, on um, tapering doors, trying to reach people through the airwaves, through their TVs, through social media, that's great. But I think the message has to be clear. It has to com be compact. And it has to stir some type of emotion. It has to basically get people from saying, you know what, maybe I do want to vote in spite of all the fatigue that I may be feeling from not having a job. Um, this coronavirus is still here. Um, the police departments still look um, to be performing as poorly as I thought. You know, that's, I think, where the big touchdowns come in. And it's, it's kind of funny, right? There's not a lot of fanfare or, um, or a lot of celebrity given to what I'm sure are an enormous amount of brainstorming sessions as to what should our message be, right? I want to pivot I, I, and, oh, go ahead, Lynn. Oh, sorry, can I just jump in and sure. say that um, it, the balancing act here for the Democrats is to, to keep um, honing this unifying message 
we are united in our experience in COVID, the economic crisis, and racial injustice. And everybody in the country wants all the all of those three things to be in the rear view window. And I'm the candidate. I didn't bring this to you. I didn't preside over it. I'm not causing the friction. I'm not making it worse. That's the other guy put me in. Now, Trump, make no mistake about it, is going to reach into his familiar bag of tricks and try to make all of this even more divisive than it already is. And so he will repeat the phrase Chinese virus over and over and over again. It's not my fault, their fault. He's an expert at us versus them framing messaging and politics. So not my fault, their fault. He will try to racialize the economy. He will repeat the phrase blue state bailout. Those blue state governors, they refuse to open. They cost you money out of your wallet. Why? To help people who live in those blue states. Who lives in those blue states? Not people like you. And you know who he's talking about, his base constituency. And so he will continue to do that. And the, then, the, then the real challenge for Joe Biden is not to get sucked in to that dialogue. When you're fighting the fight on the other person's terms, you're losing. And so you have to call it out quickly for what it is and, and say that it is unacceptable, but then move back to your point, healing, national unity. And the, the minute that he stops his message and starts fighting Trump on his traits and characteristics, everybody knows who Donald Trump is. They do not need Joe Biden to relitigate the 2016 presidential election. He has to re, he has to litigate 2021, 22, 23 and 24. Make it about the future. And that it sounds like the easiest thing in the world. Candidates get it wrong all the time. They want to fight. And so he'll want to respond to Trump. He'll want to have that battle, that head-to-head -head battle over don't say these horrible things. Um, and it's it's very difficult. And so I think that's the messaging battle that's in front of us. And um, we'll see uh, if if they can stay on on their note. I want to make sure we have time for viewer questions, but I want I have one last question for you on that specific point. You're talking about this discipline for Biden to stick to that unifying message. Uh, but we also know that sometimes message discipline when it comes to media coverage means that uh, the media finds it boring or it's not news day after day after day. And we know there's been a lot of conversation about the airtime, free airtime that Donald Trump got when he was a candidate in 2016. We're hearing again in 2020 concerns from Democrats in the Biden camp that Biden is being drowned out in media coverage and that Trump can, can take that bully pulpit whenever he wants. So how do you balance that message discipline that you're talking about with the need to get in front of the people? He's got to get out of the basement. Like, got to make some news. Um, and so why not? break the, this is an unusual presidential campaign. Let's break the mold. Let's make an announcement about, this is my group of people. He doesn't have to call it his cabinet. He can call it his kitchen cabinet. My core advisors, and to hear these five people, and they're going to be advising me on these five topics, and they're my surrogates, and we're going to have these digital meetups, and like, Everyone's got some kind of digital exercise app or bike or treadmill or something that does this better than our presidential campaigns are doing it. Um, it is not rocket science. And, you know, I would go get the guys who developed Peloton to develop my presidential campaign. And, you know, let's connect people with each other and make some news. And you can do that in ways that don't involve fighting Trump on his terms. So... I want to uh, get to viewer questions because our viewers have submitted in advance some really excellent questions. And thank you to you all who wrote in. Um, and so the first question that we have uh, tonight comes from Richard. It's actually a two-parter and a friend, I'll, I'll direct this to you. How long will it take after the November presidential election to know who won? And what happens if Trump says the election is rigged and won't leave? Yeah, so in terms of um, how long we'll know, 
Uh, I think that's going to depend um, one on how much clarity we have going in about how the voting is supposed to work and how quickly experts, particular, uh, particularly in newsrooms, uh, get comfortable with um, calling in an election that is not conducted uh, through the normal um, sort of channels, right? So um, how long? Um, I I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll know an answer uh, rather quickly, but given how things have developed um, so far and given that there's a push to try to have uh, fair uh, elections uh, through a different modality, uh, I cut it, I cut ourselves some slack, right, and say that um, there's going to be some um, added length, um, some uncertainty, uh, probably uh, right around uh, before and after the election, um, and that that's okay, right? This is part of what it means to run um, elections with integrity in a health during a health crisis, right? Um, so I think that would be the way uh, to to look at it, right? That of course you know added length could mean people are are not playing by the rules, but I think more than anything, added length to the election count is gonna be that, um, you know, we're gonna have to do it differently um, and, and differently in a way that is fair for, for everyone involved. Um, in terms of what uh, the president does, um, you know, assuming um, that he's delivered a, a loss, um, if, you know, if you were to claim um, about, uh, about the election being rigged, that it's unfair, I mean, that, 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 that shouldn't be surprising, I think, to people that are his critics, and it sh probably shouldn't be surprising to the people um, that support him, right? I mean, the whole, the whole uh, sort of um, one of the main uh, themes to, to his operation is a sense of aggrievement, right? And how much more aggrieved can you be than losing uh, an election that you were supposed to win um, as the incumbent? Um, you know, I think you're starting to lay some of the groundwork in anticipation of that possible um, exit strategy, if you will. So uh, it wasn't like a, a few days ago that we heard um, some people, high ranked uh, military officials starting to criticize um, uh, the Trump, uh, the Trump campaign, or sorry, the Trump, uh, President Trump's use of force against uh, peaceful protesters, right? And in some ways, you're going to see uh, more uh, events in that way, trying to lay cover for um, some of his critics who don't exactly want to come out of the woodwork. And sort of one line of criticism is going to be, um, look, we're going to try to have a fair and free uh, election. Um, it's going to be a different modality. But just like in baseball, we're playing nine innings. There is no, we're just going to play three innings. We're just going to play five innings. It's a nine inning game and whoever is out on top at the end, that's it, right? And so I think you're going to start seeing a few more voices, uh, primarily on his side of the party, um, try to come around to, to, to that possibility and the strategy of how do we handle this uh, gracefully? You know, because it's not just about him, right? I mean, he, he can, he can uh, claim in the event of a loss that the election was rigged, but this has repercussions downstream for other Republicans that run in the future. I think most people focus on, well, he's opening the door to other people uh, misbehaving or acting out the way he has. That's true, but by the same token, you know, um, he also uh, makes things more complicated for other Republicans that might want to run on a slightly different um, agenda. Our next question comes from Gwen, uh, and she asks, considering the current mindset of the country being months under stay-at-home orders, how do you think it will affect the direction that the voters will swing? Lynn, what do you have uh, thoughts on that? Well, it, it's sort of like we were saying before, 65% of the country think things are off on the wrong track. That's a number that is growing week by week. This is not good for the incumbent president. So. There, there is a, a, a school of thought that says voters make up their mind by doing a performance evaluation. So are things good or not good? And pretty clearly, nobody at this current moment, nobody is saying, gosh, I want to have this week or this month or this three months or this six months. I want to have this every year. This is really good. Um, it's just not. And so who, who's, who bears the cost for that? You know, as Efren said, even though Donald Trump didn't bring about coronavirus, he, he didn't bring about really any of the tragedies, he is responsible 
for them in the eyes of people who are just saying this, what's happening here has got to stop. Not good for him. So in the interest of efficiency, we're going to combine two questions that we got, uh, one from Sharon and one from Simon. Uh, if the Postal Service doesn't get help, what may happen? Will it affect our ability to vote by mail? And then relatedly, why are mail-in ballots such a flashpoint for Republicans? Efren, you want to take that one? Yeah. So, I mean, the Postal Service hasn't been getting help, right? Um, so it's been on a slow decline for quite a while. It hasn't exactly been a moneymaker. And even if we can complain about the quality of delivery service, um, the reality is that it's been operating in spite of um, funding uh, limitations, right? Um, so uh, will it affect um, our, uh, our ability to vote by mail? Uh, I'm not so sure that, that, that funding or lack of funding is actually going to be the, the thing that um, makes voting by mail go awry, right? That, that, that is what I wouldn't put, pin it on the Postal Service. Now, why are mail-in ballots such a flashpoint, I would add, for some Republicans? I think it's just an intuitive um, gut reaction if you happen to be um, sort of right, right of center, right? You have your in party. Who's your out party? All of these other individuals, many of whom don't look like you. And it just sounds very intuitive that, you know, if those kinds of individuals are up to no good on other dimensions, crime, immigration, et cetera, they probably don't take uh, the, the, the electoral integrity of voting um, to heart the way we do, right? And I think that that is sort of why you see it. I also think it doesn't help that, um, you know, the clarity of a anti-voting by mail message is not matched by a equally clear and intuitive pro-vote by mail message. You know, we're, we're in this sort of like really weird bind where um, all of the evidence is on the vote by mail side. And it's pretty clear. There is no built-in advantage to any of the parties, right? This is a, a choice of political will, but the messaging is not the way um, you can crisply say it off the tongue, the way you could say well, by, voting by mail is gonna lead to a widespread fraud, right? But to delve into that more, Lynn, are Republicans making a mistake in, and particularly Trump, in going after vote by mail? To Efren's point, there is no evidence that one political party is advantaged over another. Uh, so is this a strategic error by Republicans? Absolutely a strategic error at this moment in time. People are going to, people are not going to go out and wait in line for three hours in a crowded area to vote. And so the convenience of being able to vote by mail helps everybody. And as Efren said, it is worth repeating. There is a paper that was out in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences today that shows no advantage for either party in terms of turnout or vote share from counties across the country that have transitioned to vote by mail. And so if people are going to stay home in November, you want your voters to be able to vote by mail. And so this is just a, it's a blunder. Jamie asks, uh, and, and very straightforwardly, if you were Trump, what is your best strategy? And I'll open that up to, to Biden as well. Uh, I know we've talked a lot about sort of evaluating their, their messaging, but from a political strategist standpoint, um, and a friend, we can start with you, uh, what do you, what would you be advising either of these candidates? So, I, so in terms of Trump, you know, this one's sort of hard, hard for me, but as a political scientist, if I actually got brought on board, I think he's kind of already doing it, which is trying to dig himself out of the hole he started out with, with beyond constituencies that naturally were inclined to support him, right? The problem is that hole is pretty deep, right? So I was it yesterday, I think I saw a news report where his uh, press secretary tried to try to criticize Mitt Romney by saying that eight that uh, Donald Trump got eight percent of the African American vote, and I thought eight percent like that's that's your strategy to basically peel off a few individuals who would probably either not vote or vote Republican uh, anyway. I think it's a strategy with Latinos, with uh, some Asian Americans. I think what he is hoping for is that he can peel off 
enough of those individuals where he uh, essentially softens the punch that a Democrat who's in command can actually deliver with these constituencies. On Biden's front, you know, I got to go back to something that that Lynn um, sort of had alluded to. I just think the message has to be clear, crisper. Um, and I think what the biggest challenge, um, I think, for Democrats, this isn't just Biden, is they are the more diverse party in terms of economics, in terms of race, in terms of a lot of other attributes. So the big challenge is always threading together those various constituencies that call themselves de Democrats and keeping them together long enough um, that they can actually stay engaged and want to turn on and vote come election day. Now, I think there are some things that are in his favor that I think he still needs to take more advantage of. So this theme of inequality, it doesn't have to be racial, although that is definitely one of the more powerful undercurrents to it. But, you know, there is inequality galore that has been cascading since the new year began. And it's on people's TV screens the whole time. I think he needs to wrap himself um, in that theme, basically saying, I, I think we all feel each other's pain. Um, and I think we can draw on that to build, you know, a, a better America, right? Something along those lines. But I, I, I got to be honest, I, I, you know, I wish I was seeing it, but, but I'm not seeing it yet. Right, so I'm not I'm not that pessimistic, but I, I do hope that they that that Biden does push on that. I think they're pretty cognizant that that the tough part for them is keeping this motley group of folks together in the first place. So our final viewer question comes from Susan, and I'll pose it to you, Lynn. Uh, young people go to social media for news and information, but there is pervasive false information on social media about Joe Biden's ability to be the next president. How do we encourage young voters to find the facts and not be influenced by what they see or hear on social media? So I think that it is worth saying again that social media has a lot of attributes, but um, don't, don't get sucked into thinking that it is the only place people get news. It, the, this is it, the evidence really does suggest that even even young people, even our college students at UCLA who are are all into shortcuts and efficiency for finding information, they do understand. Look for a legacy outlet on Facebook or Twitter. Look for an LA Times. Look for a New York Times and ABC News, not some news organization you've never heard of. So people. So thing number one is even even young people can recognize legacy media outlets and that they stand for quality reporting. The second thing is that often the people who click on those stories, you know, whatever it is about Joe Biden that makes him unqualified, oh, I'm going to click on that. Those are people who already are leaning toward not voting for him. So the thing about social media is that it is user generated but also people can self-select into the information they expose themselves to. And people are good at that. If you like bike racing, you click on a lot of bike racers. If you like baking, you click on a lot of bakers. And the same thing is true with politics. If you like Democrats, you click on a lot of Democratic type information, even if you're unaware you're doing it. So try not to worry too much that just because there's false information on social media, it means that everybody is seeing it, reading it, and believing it. Chances are, it's not persuading anyone. It's just making the people who already feel that way feel even better about the way they feel. Lynn, I have to say, I think my heart grew three sizes to hear that even <laughs> young students recognize and appreciate legacy media. Uh, I feel like that is a sentiment that I fully endorse. Um, and with that, I think, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have. Uh, I could talk to both of you for hours, and I'm so grateful for your insights uh, and helping make sense of this crazy election year. Um, so Lynn Vavrek and Efren Perez, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to all of you at home for watching. Uh, we're so glad that you can join us tonight. Have a good evening. Thanks, Melanie.